Welcome from Tel Aviv to yet another episode of Tau Unbound, and today it is our great pleasure to uh, host Professor Yal Zisser. Welcome to our podcast. Uh, and for our viewers and listeners, uh, let me a little bit touch upon his very, very impressive biography. Uh, Professor Yal Zisser is currently the Vice Provost at Tel Aviv University, and he's the holder of the Yona and Dina Ettinger Chair in Contemporary History of the Middle East. Previously, he served as the head of the famous um, Dayan Center from 2007 to 2008, uh, 2010, as the dean of the Faculty of Humanities from 2010 to 2015, and as the head of the Department of Middle Eastern and African History. Um, and he's also the author of several books, which I will not share with you all their titles, but they're all available on Amazon about Syria about the legacy of Assad and a little bit about Lebanon. Got his PhD from Tel Aviv University, served as a visiting professor at Cornell and a visiting research fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy in Washington, D.C. Again, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. So the October 7th uh, war um, finds us in a very peculiar situation. I would, I would say even unprecedented, your colleague Itamar Rabinovich just uh, published an article the other day labeling it as the first Israel-Iran war. Would you agree with that description? Well, clearly it's not another round of uh, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Arab-Israeli conflict in general came to an end because most Arab countries signed peace agreements with Israel and maintain these agreements, even uh, nowadays, when there is a war in uh, Gaza, so the problem is not with the Arab world, it's not even with the Palestinians, the PA, we can uh, criticize it for not condemning Hamas, but the message from Ramallah, we recognize the right of Israel to exist, we want to live in peace with the Israelis, so, so it's Hamas. And when we speak about Hamas, we speak about radical Islam, we speak about this trend, uh, about ISIS, and yes, also about Iran. And, uh, well, actually, we uh, witnessed a war with Iran, indirect war, in 2006. The war between Israel and Hezbollah was actually the first round uh, of hostilities between us and Tehran, and now it's the second round. And in between, of course, a wide range of Israeli military activities in Syria, which are targeted at pro-Iranian targets. Indeed. Now, let me ask you this. You, you mentioned the comparison that has often been made in Israel between Hamas and ISIS. What is right about this comparison and what is wrong about this comparison? Well, when you look at ISIS, uh, you see an organization, very radical one, that was able, let's say, during the uh, last decade when there was a civil war, ongoing, ongoing civil war in Syria, to take control, to occupy uh, wide regions. Uh, the, the size of this territory uh, was bigger than the size of Great Britain or France. And the assumption was that, well, he has an old on a wide territory, he would like to establish itself there to secure his regime and his control, so he will show more pragmatism uh, toward its neighbors, toward the international uh, community, not to antagonize anyone. But uh, the opposite occurred. I mean, I, I mean, instead of being pragmatic, he continued to promote radicalism. He assassinating, assassinated uh, Western journalists. He uh, assassinated uh, Christians and Shiites and show his brutal image and force, actually, the Obama administration and many other countries all around the world to launch a war against it that eventually led to its uh, collapse. So my argument is when we speak about radical 
organization and Hamas is exactly like ISIS. I mean, you could expect Hamas, we expected Hamas to be more pragmatic, to focus on Gaza, to try to secure his hold on Gaza, to look for and, and try to take care of the local population, but they did the opposite. So when we speak about radical organizations, they have a different logic than us. And we cannot rely on their uh, pragmatism. So can, can you share with our audience a little bit more about where they're coming from? Because when you see that degree of brutality, I, I heard one American academic describing the brutality as pre-civilizational brutality. Um, where is it coming from? Well, un unfortunately, uh, this has to do with ISIS because we speak about brutality that is being motivated by religious belief, radical beliefs and ideology. But we have to admit that uh, our region is uh, backwarded, not advanced, and such brutality we can see even in internal wars between, you know, um, take for example the civil war in Lebanon or the civil war in Syria. They were not fighting us, they were fighting each other. Uh, local communities that live together in coexistence for so many years start butchering each other. So, so this is the nature of this uh, region which is not a Western, uh, we are not speaking here about Western advanced society, but backward that society. Add to this, the dimension that I mentioned before, the, the uh, radical ideology, um, these people that are motivated, motivated by the idea that fighting the holy war against the Jews, and you get what we unfortunately uh, saw uh, early October. Now, one of the more popular hashtags or framings of what's happening is the West versus the rest. It's like a post 9-11 moment again, just like after 9-11, the West feels under attack. Um, and the feeling is that it's the Western set of values that is being targeted by the Muslim world. It's the West versus the rest. Question is that I have for you is first of all, what is it that the West doesn't get about this region? Well, first of all, we are absolutely right. We see it in three levels. This is not only the war of Israel. First of all, when it comes to the Israeli society, which was very divided, as we all know before the war, now it's united because they do understand it's not about specific territory or rights, so it's about the, our existence here. So this united the Israelis. It also brought many Arab leaders to understand that Hamas is only, not only a threat to Israel, but it's, only, it's also a threat to their own regimes and to the stability of their own countries because Hamas is a, a sister movement to many uh, radical Islamic movements all around the Arab world and Arab regimes do understand that we fight their uh, fight and their struggle as well when it comes to combat these radical ideas. And when it comes to the West, the West realized that what was attacking was the Western values and, 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 and not only Israelis or Israel itself. And still, the world doesn't get it uh, uh, right. I mean, uh, um, it's not that Israel is fighting. I mean, when, when you listen, to, you watch, you follow the Western media, it's like, you know, in San Francisco, a militant group of 20 people took over the city, the entire New York or San Francisco, and the uh, problem, the challenge is how to deal with these 20, 30 lunatics without, you know... Uh, um, causing uh, damage to the city and uh, casualties to the civilian population, uh, we 
which has nothing to do with this theory. Here it's much more complicated. I mean, Hamas, first of all, this is not a small group. This is a very large movement uh, that has many supporters and many identify with this uh, group. And it's not a small a militant uh, cell or terrorist cell. Um, this is a large movement that has a conventional army, not big one, but of uh, thousands of thousands of, of uh, militants. And when you fight this uh, movement, they can't expect Israel to deal with it the way they expect the New York uh, police or uh, um, San Francisco to address a very local tactical uh, incident. Now, if you were to give advice to the people that make decisions in Israel, what would be your main advice to them? Well, we try for many years, and we didn't realize that it didn't work, but we try for many years to live in some sort of coexistence, not necessarily peaceful coexistence, but with, with Hamas. We thought that this organization is focused on Gaza, and we can reach some understanding with this organization, and eventually we can ensure stability and quiet along the borders. Clearly, this is this doesn't work. It's either Israel or Hamas as a political uh, movement, as a regime that has full control of, uh, of Gaza. So my message is don't repeat uh, your previous mistakes and don't even think of coming into terms with this organization. And assuming that the best case scenario happens, that we're able to destroy Hamas's military capabilities and infrastructure, that even the leadership of Hamas is expelled out of Gaza in the same fashion Yasser Arafat left Beirut to Tunisia, then the question is, what do we do with 2.1 million people in Gaza, uh, with the median age 18? It's important for our listeners to hear that. The one single largest age group in Gaza is 18-year-olds. What do we do with, with them? So, first of all, you know, one of the arguments that we used to hear, hear in the past against any Israeli action against Hamas was that it had no alternative, because what was the alternative at that time? You know, people said, you know, gangs will take over Gaza. It's better to have a clear address, somebody strong that you can deter, and but but you can also contact and reach some understanding. It's better than having chaos, having, you know, militant, militant group that can attack you every day. And should we send our forces into Gaza, you know, send Israeli uh, soldiers to patrol in, 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 in the streets of Gaza, and it can cost us. But what happened two uh, weeks ago on that terrible Saturday was much... Uh, um, the, the, the cost we pay, you know, in human life is higher than, you know, uh, all of the other alternatives. I mean, we need to have, for the time being, security control over what is happening in Gaza, the same way as we have in the West Bank, or Judea, and Samaria. I mean, in order not to allow Hamas to come back and then discuss with our other partners. I mentioned before, many Arab countries share our concern and would like to see Gaza heading in a different direction, not under Hamas, and hopefully reach an arrangement that will satisfy our security concern. Now, I'd like to jump into the area of your expertise because some people say that there is an Iranian Iranian playbook for us that starts in Gaza, then Lebanon through Hezbollah joins in, 
Then the West Bank, along pro-Iranian militias in Syria, join in. And then uh, Arab Israelis. So let's talk about what's happening in Syria vis-a-vis -vis the Russian-Iranian axis. If you can share with us the brief history of what has happened in Syria since the outbreak of the civil war. Okay, so, but, but first let me say that I am not sure that the Iranians were behind what was happening in the sense that they uh, planned it and had uh, uh, knowledge about the exact details. Of course, they support Hamas, they provide it with weapon. As we know, Qatar is the one that provides money to Hamas. Uh, but I don't, don't think that the Iranian do... Uh, are very satisfied with, this, with what is happening and gain, you know. Uh, uh, but, but, but but I'm not sure that they were behind it. But but coming back to Syria and then uh, and then uh, Lebanon. Well, you know, for many years we saw Syria as our major enemy, and indeed, even nowadays when we speak about the threat of Hamas and the threat of Hezbollah, the threat of, from Syria was much bigger because Syria had um, a very big conventional army with an impressive arsenal of chemical weapons and, and, and missiles. And this disappeared during the war that erupted in Syria from nowhere and actually destroy the Syrian state. Now, thanks to the Iranian and Russian involvement, Bashar survived. But Syria is nowadays a failed state and he has no control over his country. The American there and Kurds and Turks and Russian and Iranian and even those territories that he has some control um, are actually under the influence of the Iranians and the Russians. So this is right now the situation in uh, Syria when the Iranians and the Russians are playing with each other. I mean, the Russians want to promote their interests, Iran wants to promote its interests, and uh, we managed to uh, gain from this rivalry between the Russians and the Iranians. But the bottom line is first, the Iranians are trying to establish themselves in Syria. This is a major challenge for Israel. Russia is becoming slowly, slowly a closer ally of Iran. We have to take it into consideration. And Syria became a battlefield. I mean, if Nasrallah is not interested in uh, attacking us directly from Lebanon, he can use Syria, the Iranian can use Syria, other uh, forces can use Syria to uh, attack Israel. So, generally speaking, this is a very uh, severe challenge to, to Israel. What are the most problematic pro-Iranian, pro-Hezbollah uh, groups within Syria? Well, uh, when Iran uh, involved in the intervening in the civil war in Syria, because the Russians were uh, sent only uh, aircrafts that bomb every nowadays when you see the Russians uh, uh, speaking about uh, the humanitarian situation in Gaza and thinking what they did in uh, Syria deliberately attacking uh, civilians. Nevertheless, the, Iran the Russians were very careful not to send uh, ground forces, so the Iranians sent one. And they actually sent uh, Shiite volunteers from all around the Arab world for, and the Muslim world, from Pakistan, from Iraq, uh, from Afghanistan, Shiite uh, volunteers that established themselves in Syria. And actually you have many uh, Shiite militias under Iranian control that have been deployed in Syria and are now trying to work against Israel. Now, in 2013, President Biden, I'm sorry, President Obama, showed a great deal of instinctive leadership and he said, if it will be proven to me that Assad used chemical weapons against his own people, 
That's a red line. And when it was proven to him, he didn't do anything. He actually found a very creative way to have Congress block him from doing anything militarily. So my question to you, do you see any connection between that and the following steps the Russians took against Ukraine first invading Crimea in 2014 and then, of course, the Russian-Ukrainian war? And what's happening with the implosion of Syria today? Well, uh, clearly, Syria set a model that the Russians follow in Ukraine when it comes to uh, hitting civilian targets, but uh, also uh, ignoring the so-called famous uh, red lines put in front of them by the Americans. I mean, uh, we can understand Obama because he had no backing, not in the United States, who care in the United States about Syria, not in the Western world, Great Britain, uh, France, nobody was ready to support him. He was left alone. And uh, what is more important, the, the army, the, the, the American uh, military forces, the army, the state, uh, the, the um, war department, was not happy about sending troops without any clear target. This is actually the same dilemma we are facing now in Gaza. And the Americans ask us, what is actually your target? Because hitting, at that time, Bashar, bombing some of his uh, airfields, okay, that's a message, but it's not a clear target. If you send troops, what is the goal? To occupy Syria, to rebuild Syria like you tried and failed in the effort to rebuild, uh, reconstruct Iraq and Afghanistan. So I think that the, the American administration was not at all enthusiastic about the possibility of sending uh, troops to Syria, and that's what led Obama to do nothing about this major event and this was a signal that was uh, clearly understood by everyone in the Middle East that you don't need to take the American to seriously. seriously. And yeah. another question, I'd like to take you even uh, further back, uh, post 9-11. How in the Middle East was the American decision understood to attack Iraq rather than Iran. But today, it's clear that the Iranian regime, as the chief exporter of the Islamic revolution and the idea of Islamic rule, served as the inspiration to al-Qaeda and not Saddam Hussein and Iraq. How this is being understood by well, leaders throughout the Arab world. Well, ironically, you know, when you go back and you look at Iran in 2000, Iran had two major enemies, not necessarily Israel or the United States, but to the east, the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. It's a very radical Sunni regime that promoted the idea of killing all of the Shiites. So Iran was an enemy. Uh, for the Taliban, and of course, Iraq of Saddam Hussein. So, so Iran was contained by two uh, very strong and radical uh, regional powers. And what the American did, they had a very good reason for that, but on the one hand, destroyed in 2001 the Taliban, and 2003 they invaded Iraq and actually free Iran of these two uh, groups. Now, as for the American dilemma, and it was also a dilemma put in front of many Israelis, and there was no clear answer because at that time, we have to remember that, you know, Saddam Hussein was not, uh, we, we all remember who was Saddam Hussein, who tried desperately to uh, uh, turn Iraq into a nuclear power, use chemical weapon, against uh, his enemies, uh, threaten Iraq, Israel, he said, uh, I would like to destroy Israel, uh, burn half of Israel. 
so Saddam Hussein was not uh, an easy client and uh, at that time they thought well Iran seemed to be contained and not as dangerous as Saddam Hussein and that was as it turns out yeah a major mistake a major miscalculation yeah. uh, not to mention the fact that the Americans were also behind the idea of holding democratic elections in Gaza yeah that produced uh, the rule of Hamas since January of 2006, and then since 2007 they kicked out. And by the way, also in Iraq, they turned Iraq into a Shiite state governed by pro-Iranian groups, factions inside Iraq. Which leads me to um, the day after, and again, I'm, I'm working under the assumption that somehow, somehow, Israel and the United States will be able to cripple significantly uh, Hamas military control of Gaza. Uh, what do you think are the options that Israel has the day after? The day after Hamas is taking out of the military equation, because I think we both agree that you can't kill the idea of Hamas, but you can cripple their army. Uh, yes, because you destroy ISIS, I mean, the, the state ISIS, Khalifate, uh, as, uh, ISIS established, but, but the idea is, well, uh, widespread even in Europe and the United States, unfortunately, but, 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 but still they don't have the means to carry out those terrorist attacks that they used to carry out uh, uh, some years ago. So it's a dilemma that has to do with a much bigger dilemma, what to do with the Palestinian problem. Because the current, or should we say the previous government, because now there is a change and there are new ministers and much more moderate, but uh, the, the, the government has an idea um, actually to annex all of those territories, Judea and Samaria, and maybe also Gaza to Israel. This is one possible uh, scenario. The other scenario is, as I mentioned before, work with the Palestinian Authority, but for the Palestinian Authority to be ready to go to, to Gaza, to take over Gaza, well, you need to give them something, and this will be an issue that should be discussed. Uh, and they already Israel. stated yes. that they, nothing short of Israeli recognition and Palestinian statehood will satisfy yeah. them. Yeah, of course. So unless you want to control Gaza yourself directly with presence of Israeli soldiers, you, uh, you would have to show some pragmatism. So, you know, we have a saying in Hebrew, nothing good is threatening us. Hmm. It seems like Israel has bad options and then worse options. Yes, but this is always was the case with the challenges we were facing. Should we bomb the Syrian nuclear reactor in 2007? This is a bad option because it can drag us into a regional war with Syria, or should we accept the idea that Syria one day might turn uh, nuclear? What should we do about Iran? What should we do with Hezbollah? Go to war with Hezbollah, it can be very difficult, or allow Hezbollah to uh, continue uh, its activities, and the main issue is, of course, building up its um, war machine. These are very difficult decisions, but let me once again uh, remind us all that uh, the challenges we were facing when Israel was born was the threat from our neighboring Arab countries with most of them we have now peaceful relations. Um, as for the future, once the dust settled, we need to think about coming back to track of building 
this uh, peace, promoting peace, even with other Arab countries, new Arab countries, this is the challenge and this is a possible mission. And, and that leads me to, to our final question of this fascinating conversation. And I'm asking you this question because you are holding also a very senior position at this university, which is the largest campus that we have in Israel. And we don't know how this uh, biblical proportions shock would affect Israeli society. We could turn into a Sparta-like nation or an Athens-like nation. We don't know what's going to happen. What is your sense? You, I sensed a little bit of optimism yeah. in, your, in your final remarks. Do you think that Israel will come out of it more uh, enlightened, more interested in uh, settling its relations with its neighbors, including the Palestinians, or the contrary? Israel will deepen its bunker mentality, its siege mentality. Well, uh, we can look at what happened in the past. You know, the 73 war was bitter war with uh, the, the number of casualties, almost 3,000 Israeli, young Israeli soldiers were killed we were being attacked by two, by surprise, by two Arab countries. This was a major shock, and still, uh, four years after the war, we were already engaged in peace negotiations with our biggest uh, enemy. And, and we should mention to our listeners that 2,700 ca uh, fatalities in 73, when the population of Israel was one-third of what it is today, Indeed. is almost 9,000 people today. So, so I see your strengths within the Israel. The Israeli society is much stronger than anyone uh, thinks, and, and I, I do believe that, after all, people came here in order to ensure the Jewish people normal life. And once you give people hope, but this should be real hope, not stories and not dreams, but real hope, people will follow the hope. Professor Ayal Zisser, first of all, thank you so much for educating us, for taking the time, and thank you for your optimism. I think that this is something that our listeners would like to hear. Thank you. And hopefully we'll get to host you again in the near future. And to our friends and followers all over the world, until our next episode, greetings from Tel Aviv.